MashaAllah. Well, it's nice to be back with all of you, alhamdulillah, on these Friday night halakas. I always reflect on how it might be helpful to shut the door. Thank you. Um, it's always wonderful to reflect on how, subhanAllah, Allah has given us these chances to be in the company of one another, in the company of sisterhood, but also in the company of just remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. You could be doing any any number of things with your Friday nights, mashallah. And uh, the many of you that have your daughters in these programs, inshallah, they're benefiting. Ya Rab, we pray, inshallah, in some small uh, way, if not a big way. And for all of you and all of us, Annie, it's an amazing thing that we have these opportunities again and again to be here. I reflect on the last several Fridays. I don't know what everyone was doing on their last several Fridays since we didn't have halakha, we had a break. Um, but it's just wonderful to kind of get back into a rhythm and a routine of Quran reading, dhikr, and also remembrance of Allah. So, again. so lovely to be here back with all of you, alhamdulillah, as we begin back this, uh, you know, start this year, 2024, and also kind of carry forward um, our programming, inshallah, for the rest of the year. May Allah bless you all. So we'll start, inshallah, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. So welcome back to all our Bay Area sisters who are here in person, and then our many sisters who are on online. I see you all kind of writing <laughs> the chat box there. MashaAllah. Allah bless you all. Um, and uh, I think we're, I think we can probably stop the share here and just sort of focus in on, um, inshallah, the the conversation today. Am I still connected? I don't think it needs to be connected. All right, let's disconnect that. Inshallah ta'ala. All right, alhamdulillah. So, how have you all been keeping up? Yeah, mashallah. I know. I understand very much. And I also know that it's, um, as these times continue to be challenging, we have Ramadan around the corner, we're in the month of Rajab, and it's a beautiful thing to reflect on how these are, we're now in the special months of the year. There's a, it's, Allah always gives special days, special weeks, special months, but we're kind of, ent we've entered into the countdown to Ramadan, and Rajab um, is a very blessed month. Uh, many There's many important milestones in the month of Rajab. And tonight, inshallah, I think I said this already, but we'll say it again. Um, we're commemorating, inshallah, the coming in of Rajab and the getting ready of the countdown to Ramadan by doing a qiyam. So I hope many of you can stay, those of you who are local and those of you who are virtual with us online, also will continue live streaming. Um, but we plan to do some extra ibadah or worship right after halakha um, for, the, for two more hours from 9 to 11, inshallah. And Hafidha Suzanne, who's flown in um, for this, will join me, inshallah ta'ala. And then also, um, I should also announce this so I don't forget later. Um, this Sunday, inshallah, we also have a very special program. Um, so many of you, were many of you guys with us in our Ramadan, last Ramadan when we had our big ijaza party, Quran celebration, <laughs> such. We had this request that came through um, to do a discussion of Quran, the journey of Quran, with women who have worked on Quran um, and received ijaza in it. So um, that program is happening this Sunday and it's for the women and the girls, and I hope you bring your daughters and yourselves come. It's on the other side of the bay, but they, we hop around like this with Rahma, so a lot of times we're on this side of the East Bay. This particular event will be in the South Bay. Um, we'll be in Saratoga, the West Valley Masjid, inshallah, um, four o'clock on Sunday. It's also virtual, so you're welcome to join us virtual as well. But we have uh, uh, Ustada Hafidha Maryam Amir Ibrahimi will kind of be leading a discussion with myself and Ustada Suzanne on um, all three of us actually, our journeys to the Qur'an and how we've reached it and, you know, amazing things that have happened along the way but also all the difficulties that happen along the way too. But it's meant to be an inspirational journey and discussion and really to inspire anybody who's looking into their own Qur'an journey and especially the girls. So please do tune in and bring your daughters. It was something that many of you all actually requested this program. So alhamdulillah, we finally got it on the books. Inshallah. Um, the month of Rajab is a beautiful month because well, as soon as as soon as Rajab came in, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say, "Oh Allah, bless us in Rajab and bless us in Sha'ban and allow us to reach Ramadan." And so it was a recurring du'a that he would make as soon as the month of Rajab came in. 
Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab wa barik lana fi Sha'ban wa ballighna Ramadan. And it's a beautiful um, thing to think about how uh, here's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, almost like so excited and ready for <laughs> the month of Ramadan and um, as we need to be as well. And if any year and any time we need the Ramadan, it's this year. It's this year. We need these spiritual moments and spiritual times. Um, I shared with many of you and kept you all in my du'as um, as I went to Umrah and returned just recently. And, um, you know, people have been asking me about the Umrah and all I could say is it was needed. I didn't even realize how much I needed it until I got there. Um, and I was like, yeah, this was, this is exactly what was needed in, 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 the, in a moment in time when it's just everything is so heavy and burdensome. Uh, spiritual places, spiritual people, spiritual months, spiritual days, spiritual times, and you're just your spiritual corner <laughs> of your atikaf corner is what keeps us going. As you see death and destruction and oppression all around us. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of your own ibadah in the midst of all of this, because otherwise it's very easy to just lose hope and to see everything as being unchanging and um, unending, unceasing, subhanAllah. So we'll kickstart, inshallah, today with our qiyam for the month of Rajab. And um, I hope that kickstarts everybody's ibadah and worship and getting ready for Ramadan. I will tell you, in addition to this weekend's programming, um, we also are planning for next month before Ramadan, kind of a Rahma woman's conference for Ramadan prep. Uh, we normally try to do that conference, um, you know, some weeks before Ramadan, and a lot of it is actually focused on, um, we'll have a teacher from each of the madahib, each of the madhabs of fiqh, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, um, to do like a fiqh review of Ramadan, and then also kind of a general spiritual readiness for Ramadan. So look forward, look, look out for that, inshallah, for the date and time. Uh, we'll announce that, inshallah ta'ala, in February. So we'll keep, we'll keep going here with our um, book for those of you who are joining us. Any new folks today? Welcome, mashallah, good to have you here. Welcome, alhamdulillah. Um, hopefully sisters can all say salams to our newer sisters when you see them, inshallah, for prayers and salah. And for anybody online too, I think, I think that we have a couple new folks. Welcome too, mashallah. Um, we're covering a book that's called um, Reflecting on the Names of Allah. And it is um, authored by Ustada Jinan Yusuf. And um, it's really, there's many, many books out there on the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've covered a few of them so far. Um, and all of them are excellent and great. It's just a beautiful thing when it's written by a woman. <laughs> you get a different, uh, a different feeling coming through, mashallah, different focus. Um, so anyhow, I always like to support our women uh, scholars and teachers, and so we're loosely using this book and uh, covering, we're going in that order. So right now, mashallah, we are on the name Al-Wahhab. And that's where we'll start. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What does Al-Wahhab mean? What does Al-Wahhab mean? Oh, I forgot to do this. I always do that. I always forget to do all this tech stuff. May Allah help us. <laughs> What does al-waha mean? Somebody break down the root for me. <laughs> Anybody? At least somebody needs to, somebody out there knows this name, considering you have a child name. <laughs> yes, two with the same root. Yes, Allahu Akbar. So what does it mean, Layla? Tell us. Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay. Al-Wahhab. You said? To bestow or to gift. So if we break down the three-letter root in Arabic of Al-Wahhab, you end up with Wahhaba, right? Wahhaba. So this root that always talks about kind of giving or gifting or bestowing. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is the gift giver, the one who gives gifts or bestows on you gifts, subhanAllah. And it's a beautiful thing to think about how, how um, 
when you think about, think about the last gift you were given. Just take a moment. I, I, I just received one, Allah bless the sisters, subhanAllah, right, before I, right as I came in. And as I look at this gift, like so many beautiful emotions come to mind, right? Right, so many, yeah. <laughs> They're like, what are you talking about? Inshallah. <laughs> so many emotional, beautiful things, right? It is beautiful in itself, but there's also that moment of like, oh, you thought about me, subhanAllah. Like, you didn't, have, you didn't have to do that, subhanAllah. Right, so think of the last gift someone gave you. Have you, have you captured it in your mind? Have you captured it in your mind? Could be a little drawing that your kid even drew today and, where are you, mama? Right? Or it could be, you know, an, you know, a gift that's a sizable gift or maybe a small little token thing. Have you got it? Because I have a question now, next. Okay, so this gift that you were given, what are the emotions that came with it for you? Love, thank you. A sense of love, what else? Joy, beautiful. Gratitude, yes, gratitude. Appreciation. Yes, very much so. Our sisters online are saying love and gratitude. What else? Kindness. Kindness. Satisfaction. A what? Caring. Uh huh. Feeling cared for. Feeling special. Feeling seen. Feeling like you have some importance, <laughs> right? Somebody remembered you, thought about you. Now think about this is human to human, yeah? A token gift, a big gift, but it's a physical thing. Now imagine the things that Allah has given. He is the ultimate gift giver. And so when he gives these gifts, how does that make you feel? Remembered, loved, gratitude, blessed, beautiful. Yes, absolutely. And so this is why I asked the question, so we can connect, we can connect the feelings now the question is, what has Allah gifted us with? So many things. So many things. When you think about all the things that Allah has given us, it's, in fact, we can't even count them. And the Quran tells us so. Right? If you were to count the blessings of Allah, you couldn't. Right? You couldn't even count them. But think about for a moment, what are some of these things? Think about you woke up this morning. Every single one of us in this room, since we're all here, <laughs> and those virtual too, you woke up this morning and you were breathing. This is a gift. This is not something in our control or in our hands. We can't, in our sleeping state, tell ourselves, breathe, and we get up and breathe. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. This is something Allah gives and also something he takes. How many people die in their sleep, right? It's not in our hands. And so when you, when you haven't done anything to deserve it or to make it happen, and you couldn't uh, produce it, this, and it comes to you, this is a gift. This is a gift. Does that make sense? You may strive for something, and we'll talk about the difference between striving and between gift in just a moment, but think about all the things that you may have. Many of you here are mothers. You have girls in the program. That's why many of you are here. And think about how you may have desired children, you may have hoped for children, you got married and said to yourself, I want to be a mother one day, or maybe you didn't. <laughs> but the point is, you had no knowledge of whether or not you would actually conceive. There was no guarantee of children. And that when the children came, yes, there are a handful, and yes, there's a lot of work, but the fact that they came is a gift because there's nothing that you can do as much how many, how many, how many, how many sisters and loved ones of ours do we know have tried so, 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 so much and it's not something that comes or doesn't come easily or doesn't come right away, right? And for others, it's <laughs> immediate, subhanAllah, that's from Allah, his decision too. And the ayah in the Quran says, anyone know the verse that talks about this? Because the word shows up here too in this verse. Anybody know? where he talks about giving children? Anybody, anybody? So he says, so actually I have the English for you in just a moment here. Hmm. He gifts, he gifts, yahabu, right? He gifts whom he wills female children 
and he gifts whom he wills males. Right? And so this is also a beautiful thing, the fact that, because he could have just said he gifts children, but he specifically said female, and then he also said and gifts male, making it clear that both are gifts, <laughs> not one more than the other as some cultures might uh, push. But here, it's a gift, yahibu, like he literally uses the same word wahab, he bestows or he gifts this. It's not something you can make happen, right? Do you see what I'm saying? So when you think about all the things that Allah Azawajal has given us, all these gifts, it's not also one time or sometimes, it's constantly. He's constantly showering us with gifts every single day. But a person who is, you know, uh, spiritually attuned will be able to see that. And a person who isn't spiritually attuned may very well have what we call the cup half empty syndrome, <laughs> right? Where it's kind of like, how are you? Nah. How's life? Nah. How's it going? Nah. nah, nah. <laughs> right? And yes, it is bleak times. And yes, these are difficult times. But we still give hamd and shukr. And if anybody, could, and if anybody has taught us about shukr and hamd, it's the people of Gaza. If anybody has taught us anything about being able to say Alhamdulillah in the moments of disaster when it really matters, is them. Wallahi. Yani, truly, I think they have put all of our iman to shame. SubhanAllah. May Allah give them strength and ability. Allahumma ameen, ya rabbil alameen. And all people who are oppressed in every corner of this earth. Ameen, ya rabbil alameen. A beautiful thing about al-wahhab that Allah Azza wa Jal gives these gifts and does not require anything in return. Unlike humans. When you think about, again, the last gift you were given, depending on who gave it and how and so on, I was just visiting family, right? I just came from a, a trip in which I was visiting family and carried gifts with me, right? Because that's what you do. When people are distant and far from you, you want to, right? Kindle that bonds of family with gifts, right? Imagine many of you carry gifts when you visit your family or you're expected to carry gifts, potentially. <laughs> but anyhow, there is a sense of reciprocity. You gave me, so therefore I must give you, right? Or you remembered me, I should remember you. Or shame on me that I didn't remember you, or so on. There's, however, none of this exists with Allah Azza wa Jal. He gives and does not request or require that you give him anything in return. In fact, there is nothing we can actually give Allah Azza wa Jal. Even our own obedience to Allah is for us and not for him. Doesn't help or harm him in any way, right? It's really back for us. So the beautiful thing here is, and we'll repeat this verse again and again in this section as we talk about this. The beautiful thing is that if you do give shukr and gratitude, what does Allah say in the Quran about that? Yes. Someone just said it. وَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ And if you were to thank me and show gratitude, I will increase you. It's a beautiful verse. I love it. It's one of my favorites. Because when you really think about it, what is the whole point of all of this? Is you will get. And there's nothing wrong. We said this many times. People think about, oh, the fact that we are in a place, this, this area, right? The Bay Area in general. And this section of the Bay Area is considered to be a relatively affluent place. Yes, especially compared to other parts of the Bay or the country or the whatever. And so you think about, is there a sense of guilt of having stuff? And the reality is, you didn't choose to be born in the social economic class in which you were born, which may change actually over time. You may have worked your way up or the other way around. This too is a gift because it's not a choice or something you did. You were born into a certain family. You were born into a certain safety or security. Think about all the little, little baby children, little, little children born in Gaza or in Palestine. Now, they're, it's not their choice where they're born. And there's no difference between us and that could have been us. Wallahi, well, it could have been. What is the difference? So when you have sense of safety, security, or means, physical things, this is a gift. This is a gift, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an example of a gift. And so what does Allah say? It's not the issue of a gift. You don't need to, people say this all the time. They feel guilty for having good. I was talking to somebody close to me just the other day. 
and we were saying, and I, was, I said something like, Alhamdulillah for such and such, and, the, and then the person said, yes, but I feel guilty about it. No. I mean, I understand psychologically, human psychology, I understand where the guilt's coming from. But at the same time, is that's not what Allah says to us in the Quran. He doesn't say, and so if I give you, have, have more guilt. <laughs> what he says is, what? And if you thank me, actually, I'll increase you. I'll increase you. So, th so we understand from this, having things isn't the problem. What the problem is, what you do with it. What you do with it. Because a hiba, a gift, comes to you at no cost. Allah doesn't accept, it doesn't uh, expect anything from you. However, if it ends up being used in the wrong way, misused, now it can count against you. <laughs> now it can count against you. So what do I mean? You have wealth and you don't give, you don't purify the zakat of it. You have wealth and you don't give charity of it. You have wealth and you're stingy. Huh? Now, this has been used, will be used, will be counted against you. You have knowledge and you didn't pay forward. You have time, you have energy, you have youth and you didn't pay it forward. All of these are gifts that can be then counted against you. Do you see what I'm saying? So it depends what we do with it. It's not the fact that we feel guilty because we have it. Safety, security, electricity, running water, running car, etc. No, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah for what we have. And with alhamdulillah, it'll increase. And then what do you do with it is really the question. Which is why Muslims actually are, and are, are truly, truly, they are some of the most generous people, the most charitable people. Why? Because they know <laughs> that these are gifts that if they don't pay forward, they can backfire on them and be held against them. Do you see what I'm saying? May Allah, inshallah, Ya Rabbi, may Allah grant us all kinds of gifts and allow us, inshallah, to use them in the proper ways. Allahumma ameen. And so Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us um, that you can have a gift that is something you did not necessarily work for and that you're born with. In Arabic, what do you call a talent? A mohiba, same root as wahaba. A mohiba is a talent. Somebody could be, you could work hard for something, but some people are just born naturally with this talent. Right? Some people have a talent and they have an excellent voice. They, they were just born this way. They didn't, and other people take all these voice lessons and voice lessons, right? Mashallah. Right? And somebody else just has a natural talent. They're just able to fill in the blank, whatever it may be. This is a mohiba, a talent. So Allah gives certain people, and we don't compare. We don't say, how come <laughs> that person can, or they were just born that way, and I've had to work so hard to do the same thing. Because this is where the internal effort is clear to Allah Azza wa Jal, even if it's not obvious to other people. So when we think about, for example, you have worked so hard to just be able to get up for prayer. Like it is so difficult for you to kind of keep the, re the regimen of like the five daily prayers or even the fajr prayer, you've been working on this, working on this, working on this. And the next person over, they just, ah, oh, they just get up. <laughs> they have no issue, they're not even tired. <laughs> they don't look tired, inshallah. <laughs> and they just like roll out of bed and they catch their prayer and you're kind of like, ah. Oh. For me, it's a battle to do this, right? And fill in the blank, it could be any other battle. And you, but Allah sees the difference. And each person is then rewarded according to that effort. Because if one person was given it as a gift, alhamdulillah, they get their gift. But for you, if you've struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled, that reward is commensurate with how much struggle there was. Right, and that's important to remember too. So when you see somebody with a mohiba or a talent or something that's God-given, right, and you're kind of a little bit jealous of it, know that your struggle to reach that same level of what was naturally given to them is compensated by Allah Azza wa Jal, is seen and understood, even if it's not clear to the people, to people, Allah sees it, right? He knows what he gives and he knows what he created, subhanAllah. And then we talk about, subhanAllah, in this name of Al-Wahhab, the gift giver, it's also important to know that when Allah has given you a gift from his love, it's also a reminder. 
it's a reminder that we are under his care and it's not, he, we're not given these gifts because we deserve them. This is the difference between irisq, right? Your irisq, your provisions, and um, a hiba, right? A um, hiba, which is a gift. What is the difference between the two? One you've strived for, right? Allah has already written everyone's irisq. We understand that this is fated. However, you have to work towards irisq. Whereas hiba comes to you whether or not you did anything for it. It's literally a gift. Kind of like I walked in today and there was flowers. It's so kind of like I <laughs> didn't expect this. I didn't see this coming. I didn't know, you know. It's just a gift given to you. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's a difference between the two. But what Allah reminds us of is he's ultimately in charge. He decides <laughs> who gets the gifts and who has to work towards something. And this is not for us to say how come and so how, you know, why them and why not me? This is not um, useful in any way. And if you're inclined to this, that is something we call one of the spiritual diseases or illnesses that need to be remedied and worked on. The constant comparing with other people, the keeping up with the Joneses, as they say, right? The back and forth and, you know, kind of always looking like, oh, they got that. Oh, they did that. Oh, I should do that. You know, like this, this thing is a disease of the heart. It doesn't mean that you are kind of like, you know, you're still back in the 80s or something. <laughs> like, you can evolve too. That's not what I mean. But at the constant, like, oh, it's got to be one up the other one, one up the other one. This is an illness, right? A spiritual illness. And so Allah Azawajal reminds us that Allah is greater than anything that we can imagine. And do not try to superimpose onto him human qualities. So human qualities here would be, if I like you more, I'll give you more. <laughs> That's not how Allah is. Because if he was like that, explain then how people who are disbelievers, non-Muslims, people who are, you know, forget somebody who doesn't even know about God or belief, someone who is literally a kafir. Who, what does the word kafir mean? It means that you are hiding the truth. You are literally hiding the truth. You know the truth. You're hiding it purposefully. Yet that person still breathes in the morning, still gets to their work with a functioning car that doesn't crash and explode, <laughs> right? right? They're still able to eat and drink and, and, and be merry. You see what I'm saying? So God still gives even to somebody who is purposefully bad to him. He's in charge. But also... All of this will be kept a record of as well. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's really important for us to not lose sight of the fact and not forget where exactly these gifts come from. Now, don't superimpose these human qualities onto Allah Azawajal and say, well, if I, um, if, 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 you know, if I need to, I only get gifts if, I will only give gifts if somebody gives me. We don't want to do this with Allah Azawajal because he doesn't do this to us, right? So much of what we have, we're not even necessarily worthy of, but it's a beautiful gesture of love. There's another reason why people give gifts. So we said love, we said gratitude, right? Appreciation, you might give somebody a gift because of out of appreciation. You might give them a gift for celebration, a reward or celebration of some sort. But there's also another reason why people give gifts. Distance. When somebody is distant from you and you want to kind of rekindle that, or you don't know somebody very well, you might give a gift to, right? Kind of bring that relationship closer. So think now for a moment with me about the gifts Allah has given you. Just in your mind, just take a moment. There are some gifts here that all of us have in common. We're all sitting in this room, so clearly there are things we have in common. But there are many things that are different by each of us, one versus the other, mashallah. So think about your own gifts that Allah has given you. And then think about how some of this may be just because. Some of these gifts may be because you were distant and he wanted to bring you closer. Some of these gifts may be Celebration, A plus, <laughs> something you did, mashallah. 
Some of these gifts may just be out of love and for you to have a sense of joy and connection. Do you see what I'm saying? The same reasons you may give gifts are reasons why you're given gifts. And so it's worthy to think about as well. That Allah Azza wa Jal al the, the gift giver, right? All these different reasons. So since we're getting close to um, Aisha and we're going to have a, a break in a moment, I want to end this section with three things. Three things. These are the practical. How do you take the word Al-Wahhab, this name of Allah, and implement it in your life practically? Ready? Number one. Number one, to be grateful. So we'll repeat again the verse. وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ that if you were to thank me, show gratitude to me, I will increase you. So be a person of gratitude. What does that look like, practically speaking? Some people need to be reminded, like they need to have an action of gratitude. Other people, they're just constantly, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. They're just like people of gratitude. Everywhere you see, anytime you see them, alhamdulillah, right there, alhamdulillah. It's already part of their nature. But other people, truly, it's like a... a, a a cup half empty <laughs> and so you have to like literally make it part of your schedule so they literally that they now have they sell in the Muslim bookstores gratitude journals so if you are if journaling helps you buy a gratitude journal use a gratitude journal right this is actually really great with the teens like give buy them and gift them a gratitude journal Mashallah, I did this with some young people, and it was great. They were all they were all about it. All the highlighters and all the colors and all the sticky notes and all. <laughs> it's like the big thing on TikTok right now is right organizational, whatever, right? Like they're all like you know how to like all beautiful script and all this organize. I'm like great, put it all in your journal. <laughs> and so it worked really well. But you too can use a gratitude journal, and I recommend it. And if you're not keen on journaling, that's okay too. But before you put your head down or as you put your head down at night, take time to thank Allah for whatever it is that day. The good, the bad, the ugly, right? All of it, honestly. Be a person of shukr and hamd. So as you put your head down on that pillow, you're saying alhamdulillah for and actually list out what those things are. Alhamdulillah, my car functioned today. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Right, that I had a difficult moment with my kid, but we were able to hug. Alhamdulillah on X, Y, Z, whatever it may be. Because if you go to sleep with shukr, and you wake up in shukr and hamd, then you're constantly a person of gratitude. Because what is the first thing that needs to come out of our mouth in the morning as we wake up? What do we say? Alhamdulillah so it's hamd, alhamdulillah, the one who brought us back to life after we were dead, <laughs> right? This is alhamd. So you, you literally wake up in hamd and you go to sleep in hamd. Gratitude, right? So that's how you practically implement number one. Number two is to use the gifts that he's given you in a way that would please him. So think about it like this. If somebody gives you a gift, every, every one of us, we're not, we kind of cringe a little bit <laughs> when it's a cheap gift. <laughs> you're kind of like, because then you really think about it. You're like, was I like not worthy enough? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of, or like clearly something is like ruffled and rumpled and already has been used. And you're like, what's going on? <laughs> you're like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that there's this piece in you that's kind of like, what's going on here? So you don't want to cheapen the gifts Allah has given you. What do I mean by that? If he's given you time, if he's given you energy, if he's given you wealth, if he's given you knowledge, whatever he's given you, you want to use it and you don't want to cheapen it, right? You don't want to be stingy with it. Do you see what I'm saying? Because you will be held, because then you'll be held accountable for it. Do you see what I'm saying? But if you give freely of it, you've, get, you've been given it freely and you give freely of it, then it won't count against you. In fact, it will count as a good thing for you. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's really important that we use it in his way and certainly never in the haram. And certainly never in the haram. Imagine if he's given you wealth and then you use it in the haram. Right? You purchase with it or do with it things that are haram. 
or he's given you knowledge and you kind of outsmart somebody or you uh, use that smart to take advantage of somebody. On the way here, I was counseling somebody, talking to somebody, and I, was, I told her, I said, what, the way you're describing this to me, you're being taken advantage of. This is not okay. Right? It's, it's, it's imagine using your, to outsmart somebody because you're smarter than. Right? This is all on the haram. Right? You're taking a gift and making it haram. <laughs> Number three, to be a gift giver yourself. Allah has given you gifts, so give gifts, right? And here I mean it could be the small token things. It could even just be a hug. <laughs> it could even just be, I see you, I hear you, I support you. Right? I'm here for you. And it could also be actual gifts. So I'll end with the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he says, Tahadu, tahabu, right? Give gifts, and this will increase you in mutual love, right? So we are people of gifts. We just we literally give gifts to each other just because, right? We want to increase the love between us as sisters and brothers, or as family members, or as just the ummah. So with that, we'll pause here, inshallah ta'ala, go for Aisha, and uh, we'll come back, inshallah, and continue. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam All right, my dear sisters, inshallah, we'll get started again. Sorry for the sisters online waiting for us, inshallah. We were a little bit delayed here. Uh, I don't know what I just did, mashallah. Start that again. Yeah, it'll be. Okay, I think that's ready. All right, inshallah. Are we ready to get started again? Everyone settled back in, inshallah ta'ala. All good. Alhamdulillah. Our sisters joining us for the qiyam, are some sisters staying behind, inshallah? Some, some, some folks? Yes, some folks. Are we having just a very cozy qiyam? <laughs> if you guys can stay a little longer, please do, inshallah. Um, I don't know how long exactly We'll all stay, but I think the plan was on the schedule from 9 to 11. So we'll see, inshallah, how that goes. We'll take a short break after the halakha for transition, and then we'll get started, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, let's restart here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. So we'll continue on, inshallah, with the um, names of Allah that we've been doing. And we just finished covering al-Wahhab, the gift giver the one who bestows gift, gifts. And now we're going to go into somewhat of a heavier topic, if you will. And it's an important topic, and especially, especially, especially at this moment. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. The next two names, and they go together, they're taught together, um, or they make sense to teach together, yani, is al-adil and al-muqsit. Al-Adil, justice, is typically what we translate this word. And a lot of times people actually translate the next word, muqsit, also as justice. But to make it more clear, and we're going to make it clear as we go here, we're going to translate it for ourselves as equity. So justice and equity. And because this time we're seeing so much injustice, it's such a heavy, heavy, heavy discussion, and many people are asking, where is Allah's justice in all of this? So let us go through this together, inshallah ta'ala. In the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal emphasizes justice. You see the word adil come up over and over and over again. And it is important to remember that Allah Azza wa Jal speaks of justice and speaks of himself as the just the just, right? Meaning he can do anything and he can decide on anything. And even though he could do anything, he actually forbids for himself injustice. He forbids for himself injustice. So that means, what about the rest of us? Even more so, it's incumbent for us to forbid injustice on our own selves, right? Or that we become unjust. 
Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, doesn't the system seem flawed? You can have two people who, let's use an example of the justice system, right? The quote unquote justice system. You can have two people where according to the letter of the law, they should both be punished. Let's say it's theft. And if you look at it outwardly, they both stole. They took something that didn't belong to them. But if you were to go deeper into the story, you find that one person was hungry. And so forth, they stole because of hunger, need. And the other person wasn't hungry, they just stole because they could. <laughs> they could get away with it, right? Or they could take more or have more, if you will. So when you look at the letter of the law, technically they both look like, if I stole, therefore I should be punished. But Allah Azza wa Jal is the just, meaning is able to see, kind of like what we said in the last session, you're a he's able to see into the nuances that other people can't see, what's not obvious to other people. And so the judgment of Allah is based on that. And there are many things that you may not know or understand. And I say this often, you may hear me say this actually in dua, and maybe you say this in your dua as well. Ya Allah, help me understand what is not visible to me. Thank you, Hayti, mashallah. What is not visible to me, what is not clearly understood by me. And help me understand that it is my deficiency not yours, that you are just, and that you know what you're doing, even when I can't understand it, and that deficiency is me, not you. Do you see what I'm saying? That is a very important place of humility to be. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us these names, the two names, Al-Adil and Al-Muqsit, in order to make sure that we understand clearly that it is not just justice, it is an all-encompassing justice, which means that there is a 360 here that you may see part of it and go, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't see it, I don't understand. But there's actually much, much more to the story that Allah knows and understands that you don't have access to, that you don't have, what? Access to. And so much of what we're seeing right now is exactly this. Yes, it is injustice and it is oppression. Why is it happening? There is parts of the why here that is not clear to us and may never be clear to us. And I'll tell you more. In al-muqsit, the concept of al-muqsit, if you kind of break this word down further, because we talk about equity, that everything in the scales ends up balancing out. But it may not balance out in your lifetime. You may not see, we may not see, we pray, we pray, we pray, Ya Rabbi. In our lifetime, we see oppression ended. In our lifetime, we see those who are oppressed compensated. But it may not happen. It may be in our children's children's lifetime. We don't know. Allah, I mean, who knows? Allah, like, who knows? It's already been 75 years. Like, who knows? And so this is where a person of belief and faith doesn't give up and doesn't say, God isn't just. No. God is just. And it's an all-encompassing justice, but we may not have full access to it, or it may not be in our actual lifetime that we see, because it's a long span. Of, humanity has been here <laughs> for eons, right? And they may be here more. Wallahu alam. So it may not be in our limited span of life. Does that make sense? It doesn't make you feel any better necessarily, but it clarifies a little bit more. And so, when we look at Imam al-Ghazali and his explanation of justice, he says that justice, al-adil, right, emanates, that just actions emanate from him and it is the opposite of transgression, it is something that is upright. Imam al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Qayyim comes and clarifies that more and he says, Justice, or adil, means putting things in their rightful place. So, when Allah is ready to, or will, I should say, put things in their rightful place, we just hope that we're able to witness that and comprehend that when it happens. So difficult. Ya Rabbi. 
So what is justice is the question here. And it says, you know, at a basic level, justice is being fair, being equitable. But you have to understand that Allah's rules that he has commanded are all just and fair. And this is where you can open up any discussion. All the things that people find problematic, where they say, mm, yeah, I don't know about Islam, it has these interesting rules about men and women and this and that, and uh, the, you know, maybe there's preferences. And yeah, there's differences. There are differences. Ultimately, this is Allah's choosing. Why do women have periods and men don't? I didn't make the rules. <laughs> and the Prophet وسلم, says, right? Speaking of the period, he says, and this is a difficulty that Allah has written on the woman of Bani Adam. It is. But it is the same period, right? The same cycle that allows us to conceive and men can't. And so there are difficulties and differences between men and women. And so this is why when people kind of wave their fist in the air and they say, you know, where is equality? We say, it may not be equal, it will be equitable. There's a difference. Equality means equal, equal, same, 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 same. But you just can't. They're just, it won't happen. As much as they have these interesting things, you might see them, social experiments where they have men wear these uh, interesting things that have them mimic what a cramp is. <laughs> and you're like, look, as much as you try, you'll never understand what this feels. Or even better, you know, the, the, when, when, when a woman is, is about to give birth, right? That feeling of, uh, what do you call it? The contractions, right? As much as you try, you, you empathize as much as you want, <laughs> you'll never understand what this feels like. And then, you know, so then you could see the men in the experiments are like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, they're like dying. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. But this body, this human female body that Allah has created has allowed it to withstand this and to later somewhat, somewhat forget this and do it again. Inshallah. <laughs> And a man just can't. I mean, there's just things, it's like as much as you try, it's not your, don't give me equality. <laughs> because if you can never feel a contraction truly, <laughs> I don't want to be your equal. <laughs> right? And if I'm going to go through stages of, uh, you know, think about all the stages women go through from a girl, young girl, mashallah, right? And then eventually you enter into young womanhood, right? With your period. And then you may... Some will get pregnant and go through that, and the postpartum period, and eventually there's menopause and all the perimenopause that comes with it. Like there's so oh, many stages, fatabarakallah, and men go through none of that. <laughs> none of those, mashallah. <laughs> if anything, they'll have their emotional midlife crisis. They're like, really, <laughs> really, mashallah. <laughs> we go through all these stages, fatabarakallah, <laughs> and you think about it, but ultimately there is an equity. Not an equality, same, same, but an equity. In the balance of things, things balance out. And this is why we talk about, when you translate this word, it's better to translate muqsit as um, equity than just justice, right? Uh, just justice didn't sound, <laughs> let me try to explain that again. Rather than to say justice, to say equity. Um, the reason I think this is important too is because when we say Allah's rules, all of them are fair and equitable. In the grand scheme of things, in the scale of everything, it all kind of balances out eventually. So we have to be very careful, again, just like we said in the last session, not to impose our human deficiency nor our modern right, view onto Allah's rules. Very important. Because this is where you get a lot of people kind of losing faith or questioning the rules of God. How come? Why is it? How come? And there is a place for questions and there is a place for being able to ask and to get answers. But there's also a place of being, say, of being able to say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا Right? We hear and we obey. <laughs> right? And to be able to say, when people say why, the first answer isn't some philosophical you know, thing that you come up with, but rather to say, because Allah said so. And now we can also 
talk about the pros and the cons and the benefits and the harms and all we can also kind of philosophize after that. But well, first thing is, because Allah said so. Why is it five times a day and not six times a day prayer? Because God Allah said so. You know, why is it also not drinking and eating? Because Allah said so and fasting, right? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Ultimately, that is the go-to answer. It's very important to start from there and to understand this point right here, that Allah's rules are fair and equitable. And to not superimpose our own modern understandings or misunderstandings on the rules that Allah has established with fairness and with equity, even if we, in our deficiency, can't fully understand them. Because the more, this is a beautiful thing that I learned from our teachers, is that the more you study, the quieter you are. The more you study, the more you realize the depth, the depth and depth of depth of of the ulum, of the sciences. And the more room there is, <laughs> right? When we're younger, I remember being a young student of fiqh, like taking my first few, like, you know, and, and studied well, and like actually being given permission to teach, but young, still very young, does have a lot of life experience, right? And like, you know, going to my masjid, I remember actually carrying, <laughs> not here, home masjid, from when I was a teenager, and carrying my fiqh book around, like, yeah, yeah, like, I've studied this, like, I know, I'm going to teach, you know, I'm going to do this, all this, you know, the zealotry of youth, like, the excitement, <laughs> excitement, right? And then everything, everything you see are like, no, that's, no, you know, they, you know, they, no, 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 they should pull up their socks a little bit more, no, no, they should, you know, they should, this should happen, no, no, that's not right, this is not right, every little, like, you know, every little thing, and I may not say any of it out loud, it's just all kind of happening in my own head, and then you study more, and you realize, oh wow, there are differences of opinion. Look, there are some things that are just wrong. <laughs> they're just wrong. They're not different of you. They're just wrong. <laughs> Inshallah, all the way through. <laughs> Inshallah. But there are some things in which there is room. There are differences of opinion. There is actually room and breadth in all of this. And that's the beauty, the beauty of our deen. That there is actually, and, and the Prophet ﷺ reminds us, that ikhtilaf ummati rahmah, the differences of my ummah is actually a mercy to us. Right? And the more you study, this is why the more you study, the quieter you are. Because when you have a little bit of knowledge, you can do a whole lot more harm. <laughs> and the more knowledge you have, the more you realize that can work, and that could work, and that could work. Do you see what I'm saying? And also life experience, it just teaches you over time. And so back to what we were saying here, is not to superimpose our own deficiencies or misunderstandings on the perfection of what Allah has. Because if you were to go into depth of the studies, you'd realize it all balances out in a very intricate web, but it all balances itself out, subhanAllah. So what does Ibn Taymiyyah say here about justice? He says, it is important to stand firm for justice because this is what Allah commands of us. It's what he commands of himself. In fact, Allah says that he'll protect a just nation even if they're not Muslim even if they're not believers. And he will punish an unjust nation, even if they claim to be Muslim. This is very important. We're seeing it right in front of us today, literally unfolding right in front of us. And I think it's um, a powerful thing because it's not just, this deen is not just lip service. Allah, when he says, he is with the just, whoever they may be, right? And I think that's important for us to understand as well. Sometimes we will run towards our family, our culture, our people, our tribe, our whoever, and stand with them even if they're wrong. But in the Quran, Allah teaches us and says to us to uphold justice even if it, if it is against our own families or even against our own selves, right? To call out injustice. That's a powerful thing. And there are so many stories in the seat of the Prophet ﷺ in which you see this unfold in his own society. You know, being in Medina, subhanAllah, is beautiful. A beautiful thing, I'm going to take a pause here and just say, um, it is, by the way, when you go, inshallah, if you've been before, inshallah, may Allah bless you to go, go again. And if you've been, if you have never been, may Allah bless you to go. And may Allah bless us all to go <laughs> again and again and again. Allah maktub lana, ya Rabbil Alameen. Write it for us. Ameen, ya Rabb. Um, on this particular Umrah, we did a walking tour of the Sira. So you read the Sira, 
Now we've read the Sita, and this in our in our own halakha, we've actually covered it so a couple of halakhas ago. We covered Sita, and you know it's one thing to read it, and you know the stories, and you tell the stories, and you retell the stories. It's another thing to be there, <laughs> the place in which these things are happening. For example, where our the hotel we stayed in was at the corner of you know right at the edge of the masjid, right beyond it used to be, as of just literally, like literally a few weeks before we got there, there was still, <laughs> subhanAllah, and in those weeks they destroyed it. Anyway, the a garden. This garden area is the area in which when you read in the Sita, when the Prophet Wasallam passed away, there was this moment of disbelief, right? Like people amongst the Sahaba, including Sayyidina Umar specifically, radiallahu anhu, it was kind of like, no, 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 he couldn't have died. Of, rationally, of course, it's possible the Prophet, but in that moment, so Dhamma even said, and anybody who says that they hit he, the Prophet him died, I'm going to, you know, he just, he was in a state of shock. You know what I mean? And in this moment, there was this moment of like, okay, now what? Like, now what happens? What happens? So you read in the Sita that they went, the, 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 uh, the uh, Ansar, right? They went into the garden area and they had a meeting amongst themselves. Who's going to be the leader now? And there's this whole exchange back and forth that happens, and there's whole this discussion. You read it in the Sita. But to go and stand there and to be there, and you're like, oh, wow. Because literally, literally up until a few weeks ago, everything was, the garden was completely preserved. You can still <laughs> go. They kept one tree. They were expanding the area. I, I, I'm not here to judge. I'm just hard. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Nevertheless, in, in the, I'll tell you what else, SubhanAllah, when we were there, so those of you who know um, Imam Dawood Yassin, who used to be here at the, in the Bay Area for a while at Zaytuna, and is now in Austin, Texas, he and um, a good friend of his, uh, NFL former NFL player Abdullah Hussein, um, and a few other brothers who are local to the Bay Area, did a recreation of a walking from Mecca to Medina that the Prophet wasallam did, his hijrah. Does anyone know how long the hijrah of the Prophet was? How many days? How many days did he and Sayyidina Abu Bakr walk? How long? <laughs> it's helpful to know these things, yeah. 15 days. And you think about, you carry as much provision as you carry, and you're also leaving quickly, right? And you're carrying as much, and you're going in a route that is not the typical route. This is why it was hard for them to find them, right? because they went in a, a different route than what was expected of them to go. Which also meant that it's difficult, it's hard, there's no one there, there's no provisions. This is a whole, I'm gonna launch into a whole Sita story now, inshallah. <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing. And his, and his daughter, right, is the one tracing the steps to get them food. Who is this daughter, who am I referring to? Sayyida Asma, radiallahu anha. And did you know that she did that same walk that they did while pregnant? Mashallah. Mm. Now, Imam Dawood, okay, who's one of the most, mashallah, um, uh, what can we say? Uh, huh? Outdoorsy. Outdoorsy. <laughs> Good, that's a perfect word. Outdoorsy people we know, mashallah. Mashallah. Imam Dawood can camp anywhere. <laughs> May Allah bless him. And you have former NFL player, right? Brother Abdullah. So you have two very fit people. And so as they finished their, fifth, their, their days of walking, they, they, we met them in Medina right as they finished. And they came and talked to our group. Mashallah, it was so beautiful to like hear their, the first reflections they have as they, as, they, as they walked the footstep, literally the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam. And the first thing out of their mouth was, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> they said, here we are, thinking we're as fit as we can be, like, you know, in our good strength and good, you know. And they're like, we have no idea how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, did that. You know, they said, you know, they are younger in age than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Abu Bakr were when they made that hijrah. And they told, they said all kinds of interesting things. I don't want to ruin the whole surprise <laughs> of their story. You should listen to their story, inshallah. Um, but one of the very interesting things that they said was um, because they had to camp in like open desert, like open area in certain places. And they were like, yep, there's jinn. 
that's like what I was like, okay, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Um, anyhow. <laughs> So they were th th talking about how, you know, physically fit and emotionally <laughs> fit, right? Emotionally, mentally fit you have to be to make a journey like that and to withstand that and to be able to come to a place knowing that you're being persecuted, not only that you're being persecuted, but the, the price tag on your head, right, is so big that anybody <laughs> would be ready to kill you, right, at any point in time. And so anyhow, um, the short story of all this is when you go and you're actually physically there, how did I start this whole story? When you're actually there in person and you're taking the footsteps, really, because look, the entire masjid today, of Masjid al-Nabawi, the whole masjid that you go to today and you call Masjid al-Nabawi, was in the original city of Medina. That was, the in, that was the city of Medina. What today is the masjid was the entire city. So when you walk through that masjid, you're walking through everything that happens in the Sira in Medina. <laughs> everything that's happening. And when you go out of it, right, that was considered like the outskirts of the city. <laughs> right? And so when you go to like Uhud, for example, and you're going to visit the mountains of Uhud and kind of understand and see like what happened in the story of Uhud and visit the grave of Sayyidina Hamza, for example, right? And all, you understand you're, to them, they were far out from the their city of Medina, right? Their masjid of Medina. So then you understand that every footstep you're taking in that blessed city, the Prophet وسلم, likely stepped foot there. And if not, then his sahaba, right? And so then there's this kind of moment where you're kind of like, wow, and here too, and here too, and wow, and this story happened here, and that story happened, it's, it's amazing. It's really a beautiful thing to kind of bring the seerah to life. So I think I was saying all of this because it was just an amazing experience. But also to say, make dua that Allah grants you the ability to, um, to go to these blessed places to revive and to refresh and to reconnect. Um, and to read the sirah, that's how I got here. To read the sirah, including the stories in which you hear, uh, which you read, that there were disagreements, that there were difficulties. Like one of the things I was saying to the group of um, attendees in the Umrah, I was saying and reminding them, don't read the Sita with these rose-colored glasses of everything is perfect. No, no. Allah Azza wa Jal could have sent down the Quran as a book, the way he sent down the tablets. He could have decided that there didn't need to be a human that then interpreted the message. But he sent us a prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as a human to live life fully <laughs> as a human. The yes, the no, the happy, the sad, the the deaths, the, the the births, the right, the marriages. I mean, all of it happens right in his lifetime, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And also, on top of that, he also sends and insists that there is a community, right, around the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? Because there are things that need to happen, including things that are bad, including things that are haram even. That the Prophet Hasha, he's not going to be the one to do this, but he's going to correct those who do so. Right? Because he's going to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And so when you read the stories of the Sahaba, there is so much in them and happening between them that's happening today with us, right? people upset with each other, people fighting with each other. There are also the major sins, and this is what I was reminding, this, our, and this is hard, because a lot of people are like, what are you saying, these are Sahaba, what are you saying? <laughs> you know? I'm like, no, listen, listen. The major sins that we read about, whether it be, you know, the, the, the things, the, the sins that you're familiar with, the lying, the cheating, theft, so on, all of this happened. But so did fornication. So did, so did adultery, so did alcohol drinking, so did whatever, murder. I mean, these things happened, even amongst, you're like, Sahaba, yes, because what does a Sahabi mean? A Sahabi means that they are a person who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and became Muslim. Now, does that mean that they're all angels? No. Were they the best of generations as a whole? Absolutely. 
And amongst them is the Prophet ﷺ that is the best of teachers and healers. And so the person who was the alcoholic eventually got rid of his alcoholism. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said he loves Allah and his messenger. He's going to do his tawbah because of the love. And eventually he did. His name was an Iman. Right? There was a person who was a peeping Tom. He would go look at the woman, right? And then look at the haram. We have a word for that today, looking at the haram. It's called pornography. That person, the other Sahaba, were bothered by him. They didn't want him to pray with them. And so when he would come to the masjid, they would say, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> we don't want him here. What did the Prophet وسلم, say to them? Da'u. His, leave him. Leave him here. His prayers will prevent him. Let him keep praying. Eventually, his prayers will be the cause of his repentance. And he was. And he did. He repented. This went away. There was another man who came into the Prophet وسلم, speaking of the Medinan society here, young man this time, and he came to the Prophet وسلم, and said something that was so foul <laughs> that the other companions, other Sahaba sitting there, literally said to him, shh, 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 shh. What, are you, what are you saying? What are you saying? <laughs> what are you saying to the Prophet? He said to the Prophet وسلم, allow me to fornicate. And they were all like, ah, can you, can you imagine the other Sahaba sitting there? They're kind of like, quiet, what are you saying? The Prophet وسلم, didn't just wave him off or kind of say haram or give him a big long khutbah or lecture or shame him. He did what we would call in psychology cognitively reframe. He literally said to him, would you like it if this were to happen to your daughter? I said, no. Would you like this to happen to your mother? No. Would you like this to happen to your aunt? Would you like this to happen to your paternal aunt? Would you like this to... And every time the man would say no, he would say, and people don't want that for their daughter. And people don't want that for their mother. And people don't want that for their aunt. And he understood. It's an important thing to put yourself in those moments and to understand what were these conversations like that the Prophet ﷺ was having with people who were coming and, you know, fighting, killing one another, having enmity with one another. People who were drinking even after the command of alcohol was, right, uh, came down. In the presence of the Prophet, the one I'm referring to, he was a veteran of Badr. He fought in Badr, and it still didn't prevent his alcoholism. That's a whole other discussion for another day of how people think that this is these, some of these things are in your hands. Oh, you can just overnight. No, these, some of these things are illnesses. They take time to heal and to get better. The Prophet ﷺ understood these things. And I say this whole story because it relates to the recent trip to Medina and the Sira tour that we were on, walking tour. But it also relates to this understanding of adil, back to this adil and justice understanding. The rules of Allah are perfect. Even when we are deficient, and even when we put our modern or imperfect understandings on top of them. And this is something that is beautiful about the Medinan society. You see that they're humans, just like us. They have faults like us. They are the best of generations. Yes, much better than us, yes. Because the Prophet was amongst them, right? And he was able to teach and heal them in such a beautiful way. And there wasn't this sense of like, you are bad out of my community. You drink, out. You fornicate, out. You want to do whatever, this and that haram thing, out. No, rather it was, da'u, keep him. Keep him here. Eventually they're going to get better. Imagine if we did that to the people of our communities. Wallahi. Imagine if we did that here, in this masjid, right here. The lack of judgment all the shaming, right? All the kind of like, it's not perfect enough. You're not good enough. Your clothes is not wide enough. You're not, you know, praying good enough, whatever it is. 
That's just not how the Medinan society was. It's not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. He was firm, and the rules of Allah were clear. These are the rules. We're not mincing any words here. But the way in which you teach and the way in which you bring people forward, and there's a whole discussion about how many of us are, um, whether we're actual mothers, like biological mothers, or whether we're mentoring <laughs> spiritually, right? In this uh, spiritual halakas that we have for the girls. It is such a beautiful and important thing to know of how to teach them and not to push them away from this deen. Haram, haram, bad, and bad, bad, you're not good enough. But rather to smile and to say, this deen is beautiful and so are you. And it works for you and will work for you. Give it time. Try this, try that with a big smile, <laughs> lots of love. I'll pause here, inshallah, because of our time, inshallah, because we're going to take a break before we mm, do our, um, our Qiyam program, inshallah ta'ala. But I just want to end with this. I just want to just give me a, just give me a moment here to end kind of with this. Um, we always end with how do you take these, this name of Allah Azza wa Jal and implement it in your life. So just like we did with the last lesson, just do with this one, number one, to commit your own self to justice, to adil. And what that means is, if you want justice for other people, you have to be willing to be a just person yourself. If you want it for yourself, you have to be willing to do that for others. Do you know what I mean? And you stand with justice with whoever, whomever it is, whether, regardless of family, tribe, name, ethnic background, you stand with justice regardless. Also, standing with justice for yourself means against your own anger, your own rage, <laughs> right? And anything that causes you to commit injustice. Because when we rage and when we anger, we say things and do things that we don't mean. And it hurts other people. So standing against yourself with just, against your own injustice means being mindful, careful of rage and anger. Having justice with your family means, just like charity starts at home, so does justice. It is not enough to be just and beautiful and kind and nice and oh, mashallah, 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 <laughs> with community members, when actually at home, you have a completely different face. Do you know what I mean? It's a heavy topic, but it's important, you know, whether it be justice to our children, our siblings, abusive um, to our blood kin, right? Unfair to our children, etc. These are things to really take into account because this means injustice. If again, if we want Allah's adil and justice for us, we can't be unjust, unjust to others and to our communities. And this, we already talked about this in a good bit about the Medinan society. So I'll just say equitable mosques. Invite your sisters in. You see somebody brand new, welcome, welcome, come on in. Well, I, see, I would see my teachers all the time. And sometimes we would think and we'd say, man, here we are like studying, 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 working hard, you know? And, you know, we kind of get the like, oh, salam alaikum, kind of like a basic salam. And then you have somebody who's like brand new, who like doesn't know anything, but doesn't even know like how important this teacher is, right? They come in and, and that teacher suddenly like lights up, it's like, oh, salam alaikum, welcome. And you're kind of like, well, I've been here like all these weeks. I'm going out here. <laughs> and that, that whole thing is like, come on in and welcome, right? We'd love to have you here because the hope is that this is going to allow you to then, I'm welcoming you here, not looking at you with suspicion of like, you look a little different and a little, you know, not fully put together and fully practicing or whatever the case is. Wallahi, this was how they were all the time. I've never seen my teacher see somebody new except that they were so excited to see them because what they also saw in them is potential. They looked at it from the eye of potential. What is the eye of who this person can be one day? SubhanAllah, it's a beautiful thing. And lastly, I lost my, <laughs> lost my place. And lastly, the last thing I was gonna say is you also have to have justice with the wider society, the wider society. And this is where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, stood with anybody who justice was for them. And th when you break down the word justice, you might've heard this before, but it's not just us. Justice isn't just us. It is for everybody and anybody that this applies to. 
So we'll end there, inshallah ta'ala. And a word of just a quick uh, logistical. Um, I have a little bit more travel. Ah, alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, however, inshallah ta'ala, we have um, Ustada Shamira and Ustada Hosayl who will be joining you for the next couple of weeks until I return. And then once I return, I'll be here, inshallah, for kind of the rest of the time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you, except from all of you. I do want to make special du'as for a couple of people. Inshallah, as we kind of close here with du'a, um, the beautiful young sister, mashallah, who, um, sisters who brought these flowers, we're going to make du'a for them. But also there's a, a, a um, um, one of our uncles who's in the hospital right now, uh, one of the fathers of a sister in our halakha here who's in the ICU at the moment in his last uh, days, inshallah, so we're going to make du'a for him as well, bi'ithnillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ma'ala al-hati Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ajma'in ya rabbil alameen. As'aluka ya kareem. Anta afu anna wa taghfir lana wa tarahamana. Anta maulana fa'unsurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask Ya Rabbil Alameen to shower your mercy down upon us. Ya Rabbi, increase us in all that is good and all that is khair. Ya Rabbi, we ask you by your special names. We ask you by the name Al-Wahhab, Ya Allah, to grant us and bestow upon us your gifts, your hiba, Ya Kareem. Ya Allah, we ask you to be people who are thankful, people of gratitude, people of shukr, people of hamd. Ya Rabbi, do not take these words of hamd out of our mouths ever, Ya Kareem. Ya Allah, allow us to be people that as we give you hamd and shukr, you give us more. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you by your names, Al-Adil, the just, that Ya Rabbi, you bring justice for all of our sisters and brothers who are oppressed across the world. Ya Rabbi, particularly in Palestine, particularly in Gaza, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Ya Rabbi, in all of our sisters and brothers in the Congo, in the Sudan, Ya Rabbi, those in China, Ya Rabbi, those who are tortured, Ya Rabbi, those who are being taken away from home and safety, Ya Rabbi, all the countries that have dealt with natural disasters recently, Ya Kareem, Syria and Turkey and Libya and Morocco, Ya Rabbi Alameen, we ask you, please, Ya Rabbi, give them back their safety, Ya Kareem. Replace what they lost with what is better. Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabb. We ask you to be those who are constantly in the service of our sisters and brothers in the Ummah. Ya Rabbi, allow us to use our time and our energy and our wealth and our youth to help them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to help others, Ya Kareem. Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabb, we ask you to always be in your service. Ya Rabbi, istakhdimna wa la tastabdilna. Ya Rabbi, use us and do not replace us, Ya Kareem. Ya, ya Ilahi, Ya Rabb, we ask you and raise our hands for all those who are ailing, for all those who are suffering. Ya Rabbi, for all those who are sick. Ya Rabbi, for all those who are having any physical ailments, anybody who is having any emotional or mental health conditions, Ya Kareem, we raise our hands and make dua for them, Ya Rabb al -Alamin. Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabb, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to bless all of our young ones, all of our children, protect them. Ya Rabbi, grant them friendships, Suhaba Saliha Amina Ya Kareem, good, righteous companionship that will aid them and help them along, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Rabbi, we raise our hands and ask you, Ya Kareem, that all of our young girls that are in this program, that you bless them. Ya Rabbi, allow them to learn this deen with love. Ya Rabbi, allow them and grow their love of you and love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in their hearts. Ya Rabbi, connect them to each other as sisters and strengthen their identity as Muslims. Ya Rabbi Alameen, allow our children to be from those who are believers until the very last day and from our progenies and their progenies, Ya Kareem. Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabbi, we make dua for our young women. Ya Rabbi, those who have just come of age. Ya Rabbi, we also make dua, Ya Kareem that you bless each and every one of them to stay righteous and on the straight track with purity until the last day, Ya Kareem. Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabbi, we raise our hands and make dua, Ya Rabbi, in this blessed month of Rajab. Ya Rabbi, Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab, wa barik lana fi Sha'ban. Allahumma ballighna Ramadan. O oh Allah, bless us in the month of Rajab and bless us in the month of Sha'ban and allow us to reach Ramadan. Ya Ilahi, Ya Rabbi, forgive us for we are most in need of forgiveness. Honor us, uplift us, empower us, and connect us to you, Ya Kareem. 
ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين وعلى نية القبول والهداية والنصر والسلام في كل مكان نسألك يا رب بسر سورة الفاتحة and for acceptance of this dua take a moment please to read Surah Al-Fatiha Amin, Amin, Amin Barakallahu <laughs>